Good morning to our listeners in the US and the Americas. And also welcome to the ones joining us from Europe and also a warm welcome to the one to the night owls joining us from Asia. Um, welcome to our webinar on trade secrets and their protection and enforcement in China. My name is Alexander Gangnus. I'm senior manager at China Brand IP Consulting. And together with me are our managing director, Dr. Hans-Joachim Fuchs, my colleague Evgenia Wajova, and also my colleague Mareike Seeselberg. What we are going, going to talk about today is um, the gaining importance of trade secrets, about regulatory change in China, and also about, first and foremost, efficient methods for their protection in China. And now I'm handing over to my colleague, Evgenia. Thank you, Alexander. I will start with talking about why trade secrets gain importance today. I believe all of you know this um, big cases, big recent cases such as Apple or Tesla where software for autonomous driving cars was misappropriated and allegedly given to a competitor in China or the recent Coca-Cola case. Um, also here in Europe and in the US there were some big biotech um, trade secret misappropriation cases. Um, how we see the situation is that um, all of these cases involve um, big multinational enterprises uh, that actually start to um, regularly enforce their trade secrets uh, in front of courts. But it doesn't met mean that uh, trade secret theft is not happening for smaller uh, middle-sized companies. Of course it does. However, uh, what we see sometimes in our clients' companies is that when the trade secrets got stolen, there were no effective protection measures in place and there is no way to defend these trade secrets or enforce it in front of a court. So the whole message uh, from us to you today is uh, how important these sufficient protection measures are to not get your trade secrets, your know-how stolen in the first place, but also to enforce it in case it happens. For the definition of trade secrets in China, they are defined in the anti-unfair competition law, which was last amended this April. And you see the definition comes quite familiar to us. Um, trade secrets are not publicly available. They have economic value because they are not publicly available. And very important, they are protected by appropriate measures. For comparing uh, trade secrets with uh, traditional uh, IP rights, such as, of course, patents, um, an important IP right, um, it's quite obvious that you don't need to register your trade secret um, and that trade secrets enjoy unlimited protection in time and uh, geographically. For the application, um, they are used for um, such know-how that is not uh, cannot be protected by traditional IP rights, such as uh, uh, commercial information, for example, your customer lists, your pricing structures, or for formula and exact compositions in the biotech or chemistry or pharmaceutical industries, but also for software. And they're gaining importance in the new industries that have uh, short production cycles. Um, so you see that trade secret is developing into a further layer of IP protection for important know-how in your company. We say product here, but of course product stays for innovation in general, innovation know-how, um, which is protected by patent in its fundamental um, inventive strengths uh, and by designs and copyrights in its um, appearance and trade secrets comes to the further protection layer for important innovation. China is not alone in trying to introduce more modern um, methods to protect and to enforce know-how. Uh, you see um, that the um, legislators worldwide are, are noticing this trend and answering to it with new amendments of laws or introducing new laws also in Germany. The new law was introduced this April as a um, um, translation of the EU directive into German law. Um, so in China, there was also the last amendment in this April, and uh, my colleague Marika Zeyselberg will now introduce these regulatory changes in details. 
Thank you very much. Um, I will now continue with the changes. So first thing, um, despite the changes in the law, um, enforcement of trade secret cases, cases of misappropriation of trade secrets is still challenging and that won't change anytime soon. Um, but still there are good reasons sometimes to, to protect know-how by trade secrets. So um, trade secrets are regulated in the anti-unfair competition law of the People's Republic of China. And um, the um, changes now uh, really are an improvement of the legal protection and enforceability in China. Um, so I would like to go into more details now what exactly has changed and later on we will also discuss what these changes mean for you for your company in China. So the uh, amendment of the anti unfair competition law came into force on April 23rd this year. So that means um, this law is actually still quite new and we will still have to wait and see what the courts in China will um, make of it. But um, the changes that can be seen in the um, law are quite nice. Um, there are four main changes. The first one is an expansion of the definition of uh, trade secret theft. That means um, the law now does contain um, or does mention hacking as a way of trade secret theft, an illegal way of trade secret theft theft, obviously. Um, this change is not that important, actually, but it is a message. Um, hacking has could have been included in the law before, too, um, but now it's mentioned specifically. So um, this is a message um, to, uh, to the people out there that hacking is something that's um, also illegal. Um, so the second big change is the increase of compensation for damages. I guess there's something that companies like to hear. Um, before it was three times of the losses um, or uh, if the losses could not be determined, um, it was 3, 000, uh, 3 million RMB um, in punitive, uh, for punitive damages. And now it's five times the losses or five million RMB. So this is quite uh, quite good uh, for companies. But as I mentioned before, we will have to see um, what the Chinese courts will um, make out of it. The third change is that um, now uh, or before it was only possible to sue companies, um, not persons and now this has changed so um, you can sue the company and the person and you can sue both of them together and um, you can even sue the um, person that um, instigated a, um, a theft of trade secret so even if somebody was not directly involved in stealing the trade secret, if this person um, or this company helped or um, supported the theft, um, they are also liable. And the fourth, and for me, the most important change is um, the lifting of the burden, uh, lightening of the burden of proof. And this is why I will um, go into further details on the next chart. So what does it mean? Um, until now, the burden of proof has been quite heavy for uh, companies who wanted to um, litigate because of misappropriation of trade secret, um, as they had to prove everything from um, starting from that there actually was a trade secret, that it was stolen, who stole it, and that it had, had been disclosed. Um, so now, um, you have still to prove that you had implemented appropriate protective measures. Um, uh, so that means you have to have a good protective system and you have to um, document, uh, to write down what exactly you did and to be able to prove what you did. Then you still have to prove the violation of your rights. 
Um, so that means you have to be able to show that the company or person um, had access or at least could have had access to the um, trade secret or the know-how, um, then you have to prove that uh, there is a risk of disclosure or that the know-how actually has been disclosed. Um, so this is only prima facie evidence you have to bring. Obviously, it's nice if you can bring more evidence, but it's not necessary. If you can bring the evidence I just mentioned, then the burden of proof will shift to your opponent. And he will then have to explain how he has obtained the information, um, like if it was a legal way um, he did obtain the um, information. And um, maybe he can show how he developed this solution. Um, for example, he could show um, documentation of tests, experiments that have led to the conclusion um, so that he had the solution found on a legal way. If he cannot prove um, that he has obtained the information in a legal way, um, well, good good for you. So what you um, should be thinking about before starting litigation is, is there any possible way that the person or the company you want to sue has obtained this knowledge um, legally? Um, and if you cannot clearly um, answer this question with no, then maybe you should first um, yeah, do more investigations and in how all of this happened. So regarding court uh, processes, court procedures, um, there are some things you should consider. Um, often, if there's a misappro misappropriation of trade secrets, um, there's also a breach of contract because often it's employees um, who steal or who misappropriate know-how and normally they will also do this in breach of their um, um, labor contract um, which normally does include an NDA or should definitely include an NDA. Um, so these two things can um, both um, be used in the uh, law case. So um, if you sue, you can sue, as I mentioned before, the former employee or your employee and their new employers or the company exploiting your know-how. You can sue them together, which is um, a good thing. And you will only have to bring uh, prima facie evidence, as mentioned before. So the most important thing here actually is if you uh, want a successful enforcement of your uh, rights, um, it is really, really, really important that you have appropriate protective measures, technically as well as organizational, and that you have a good proof documentation of them. If you cannot prove that you have doc that you have these measures, um, then there is no way you can uh, win a lawsuit based on misappropriation of trade secrets. Um, as I mentioned before, so far we do not know what the Chinese courts will make um, out of this law and the changes, um, as it's quite new and there are so far no um, judgments of uh, cases online which uh, where the um, new law was already um, entered into force but we are looking forward to it and um, as far as we see it um, it will be good for companies and yeah so the legal basis um, for trade theft trade secret theft cases um, is mainly the anti unfair competition law um, and of course, criminal law, if it's a criminal, uh, yeah, but this is not useful for your civil litigation. And then I um, also listed some more um, provisions and regulations from the state administration for industry and commerce and other ministries and authorities in China, but they are not that relevant um, for you. Probably they are only um, regulating some certain yeah, certain aspects of trade secret theft, for example, um, in special cases like um, theft of trade secrets of state-owned enterprises and so on. So they might be interesting, especially 
um, the one about the violation of labor contracts, but most important is the anti-unfair competition law. So now I will hand over um, for more details um, how to protect. Before uh, my colleague Hans jumps in, I just wanted to add that um, you always have the possibility to ask us questions via the panel on the right side, um, the go to meeting panel, where the, you have the possibility through the chat window to ask us questions whenever you want. And we will have enough spare time at the end of our webinar to answer all of your questions. Thank you, Alexander. Let's uh, mm -hmm. start with the protection measures. In my opinion, one reason for the increasing relevance of trade secret and more and more trade secret cases is the fact that the most products are relatively strong uh, secured by patent. So for a company, a Chinese company, for example, it, it's very difficult to, to infringe a patent. In contrast, the trade secret is more, is more easily to, to infringe. So we have to protect the trade secrets because it, it's more yeah, flexible. How do we uh, work in China? The trade secret, the first step is to identify the trade secrets. The most of the uh, companies, also our mandates, do not know what their trade secrets are in detail. So if we have workshops also, we ask, what are your, your trade secrets? The, often there's no satisfying answer. Secondly, we have to evaluate the, straight, the trade secrets. And finally, we have to manage and to protect the uh, know-how. Besides trade secret means technological know-how and uh, yeah, business secrets in German, Betriebsgeheimnisse. Uh, we work in five phases of know-how projection in, in the project. The first step is the inventory. What do we already have in, in terms of trade secret? What is our uh, unconscious know-how strategy? The most companies have a yeah, imminent strategy that is not articulated on paper. Though they are not aware of this strategy. So we have to find how the company is acting related to trade secrets. Second step is to define a goal. What do we want to achieve with our know-how projection measures? The measures cost money and you have to spend time. So we need uh, to define goals. What exactly want we do with the activities? Third step is to formulate a strategy. We make a difference between medium long-term act plan actions and uh, how to reach the goals and bring this to an understandable strategy paper. In the most cases, we do not have a paper, such a strategy paper in the companies. Maybe the most important step is the implementation of measures to apply the know-how strategy consistently in the relevant products and technology fields and the business areas. The point here is that we have many uh, measures, some hundred measures are possible from the fingerprint uh, control device to contract NDAs and so on. So we have to select some relevant measures. It's a time of costs and uh, a question of costs and time. Finally, we should control the system. Let me say after a period of one year or so and, and to uh, fine tune it. That's it. Uh, case of the process industry it is a case from a chemical uh, industry the job was to do the analysis of the situation in a subsidiary to define objectives and to find a strategy then in the next step to create to recommend calculate measures to implement in a chinese subsidiary for the workshops it's important to define the right groups. You know that the, the people do not understand each other. So the, the IT boss has a totally different uh, language compared with the marketing managers and the, uh, the legal, the head of legal. So to, to mix, to combine the right people in the workshops. Here we had a group A, 
it was the, the operations, R&D engineering, the material, we had a lot of problems with chemical materials, chemical manufacturing processes, production, and so on. These people understood uh, each other. They had a similar language. The second work, workshop was the market-related people, customer relationship, marketing, sales, research, and so on. And finally, the group C was component by HR, legal, IP, IT, facility, security, and so on. The point is that in the workshops, the people are not often not so open. The, the manager A hesitates to communicate the risk or trade secret problems of his colleague B. So you cannot guarantee that you get all the in relevant information about trade secret, theft, know-how protection in a workshop. As a result, we have done additional in-depth one-on-one interviews in the afternoon. So it's you get much more deeper information if you meet somebody having a coffee together and ask some uh, deeper questions. And then you get uh, uh, often the very interesting, re most relevant answers. This is a checklist, a part of a checklist. We work with a checklist containing around 850 questions uh, from many uh, sectors. This takes time to, to ask 850 questions in a, in a subsidiary. This is <laughs> time consuming, but it makes sense. It definitely makes sense. The content of the questionnaire you see here, it's you have a gap analysis. You ask about the document security, human resources, unintentional loss of know-how, the legal measures in the company and so on. So it's a lot to ask, but the results are worthwhile. You see that uh, you can, if you have the results of this uh, round of, of workshops and interviews, you can compile a trade secret inventory or register as I told you, the most companies do not have such a register. They do not know that their trade secrets in detail. You can identify and assess the trade secrets and, the, and their carrier. It's the same problem that the people do not know who carries the relevant uh, know-how. For example, in the guide, in the handbook, there is a figure of you have to heat the chemical uh, up to 100 degrees. And this is wrong. The, the, work, the, the workman or the, the engineer knows that you need to heat it up to 103 degrees. This is a know-how only the workers have or the engineer. It's not written in the handbook. You can identify the vulnerabilities, analyze the risks, and so on. So you see the results, the outcome of this huge work of interviews and workshops is quite good. It's valuable. You are also able to manage a trade secrets. Here we use software tools. There are tools available uh, for the management of trade secrets. It's not a protection tool, but it makes the, the, the trade secret sector transparent. Next step is to define a goal or the goals. What do you want with your activities in the trade secret sector, trade secret protection? Do you want to blockade the market access for, for example, Chinese competitors? Or do you need a time advantage over the competition? Or you target income from licensing or cross-licensing to, licensing to other companies? You want to make profit? Or do you want to force Chinese competition, for example, to invest in costly R&D and so on? In, in total, we have around, let me say, 20, around 20 strategies of uh, or goals, main goals of uh, uh, trade secret protection. So you must find your, your way. What do you, what is your goal? What do you want, really? Some examples of strategic options. Castle and mold, build a, build a complete wall around your tele technology. I think that's good, but it's quite expensive. Not to build a complete wall around all your technology, you need a lot of efforts, uh, money, and also time. 
uh, to do this. It's, it's very complicated. Different is a shotgun. Protect everything that comes before the gun from the market. If you see something from the competition, shut it. Take action related to trade secret know-how protection. Or circle is one strategy. Protect around the competition technology. Piracy. You target and prevent the theft of know-how related to counterfeiting. Or you try to standardize. Attempt to search, to set standards with your own technologies, and so on. So uh, there are many uh, strategies, and you have to, to, to choose what you want. A key message is that you need a, a, a holistic approach in trade secret and know-how protection. It doesn't make sense if you secure your R&D laboratory by a fingerprint control, access control device, or you design excellent high professional NDAs, and your engineers talk a lot and talk too much during a coffee break in a conference. It's incredible how much people talk in coffee breaks and conferences. Right? Airbus has given a warning about this. They said to their uh, engineers, be careful, don't talk in conferences about aircraft technology. So you, you should have a think in terms of a holistic approach. The Chinese do not attack your like the Western chess uh, the, the, for example, the Westerners, Trump attacks Huawei directly. The Chinese will never do this. They surround you, uh, try to get terrain, uh, go step by step. It takes time. So they surround you, undermine this. This is a total different strategy. They do this also in the, in the uh, sector of trade secrets. Americans have created this chart. I think that's quite interesting. How do Chinese companies collect know-how, trade secrets? Uh, you see, they have non-traditional collectors, private persons. They work with joint ventures in academic collaborations, science and technology investments. They do M&A, recruit talents, have, uh, create some front companies in the West. They have intelligent services and so on and so on. You see, this is like a puzzle. They collect pieces, and then step by step, they create a whole picture. And so they collect uh, know-how, in part legally, often illegally. So that's why you, you should uh, think in, in holistic categories. These are measures. Uh, in various protection areas, we have defined 16 here from the document securities to precautions for visitors in the company, leaving employees are very important, uh, protective measures for business trips, important, the laptop, if you travel to, to China, very important, how to protect it, and so on. You should consider and think about, analyze all these categories. If you miss one, you can have the problem with exactly this category is relevant for your trade secrets. So thanks, Hans. Um, so we heard a lot about uh, theory, and I want to get some more in detail about how it looks in practice. That is actually some uh, process that we had during the factory know-how protection workshop in China, where we wanted to make a factory of one of our clients um, safe in terms of uh, know-how protection and trade secret protection. And um, I want to introduce to you the steps that we took. Of, of course, first of all, you need um, to pre prepare the workshop and you need to, as Hans already said, select the right participants. Um, you need to have uh, people from all the relevant departments and also people that are not shy from shying away from from telling their peers um, what's actually the case and where they see some flaws or um, where 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 they see the, the the points that need to be tackled um, and of course you need to know what's what, what what has to be done in the end do you want to have the whole factory secure like from the outside to the inside and uh, from the first to the last uh, point or do you have uh, or do you want to have 
maybe only the the uh, the crown jewels secured and um, the second point of course is very important to know about the current case law in china every time we do uh, such workshops and such projects we need to know um, how are the latest decisions in china related to trade secret theft um, what are current precedent cases because you can have the best measures in your opinion in, in your opinion the best measures to protect your trade secrets but if it's not protected by or if it's not covered by uh, Chinese law, then it's basically useless. So and then, of course, you need um, to have the workshop um, on premise. We did that in a round of, I remember it was about six people from a general manager to IT to R&D and uh, also finance. And um, we did it with a like a, well, so to say, in, in, in a workshop just to, quite easily with a flip chart and also not openly but um, then everybody had his time to to think about issues that he might have seen in other departments where um, they might have seen some flaws uh, like for example um, there was a testing lab that was directly between the um, the factory hall and the 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 the, the uh, the dining ro room or the cantina so everybody passed by the um, the testing lab and the testing lab was not always closed so there's there would have been the possibility that somebody just sneaks into the testing lab and checks out the latest uh, developments and everything so um, that are points that are then um, brought to the flip chart and then are discussed and uh, from that point we would design some ways about or some solutions if that could be solved easily whether it could not be solved that easily um, and, but first of all we just bring it to the table and then it's there and after that of course if you have the results of those workshop you need to have it assessed by a chinese lawyer um, you would need to have an opinion whether those so-called flaws are really flaws that are relevant for the protection of trade secrets if it comes to really a, a court case or if those are just things that could be maybe neglected or you need to prioritize also always in um, comparison with the current case law with precedent cases and everything um, after that it is important really to, to, to define measures that are to be taken. For example, um, put a fingerprint-based uh, lock system to that room, to the testing room, or just um, make sure that there are no, no windows in that door to the testing room so nobody can take covered pictures. Um, and also, you need to document those measures that you are taking by photos, by videos, manuals, protocols, invoices from the uh, service providers that helped you install those measures. And then, of course, the implementation, the actual implementation, and always be sure to really check what's going on there because um, some people might tell you that they have done this and that, but in the end, it's done in a way that was not... Um, how it was supposed to be and then in the end um, if it comes to a court case then you have nothing at your hands but only costs so always be sure that the whole process is streamlined and everything is done in a way that can be documented and especially when it comes to China it is important to have all those measures that you are doing notarized if it comes to a court case in China, um, well, let's put it that way, nobody trusts each, trusts each other. So um, only if a notary says that this measure was really implemented and it was implemented at that day and at that time, Chinese courts would trust that notary that he said the right thing and that he witnessed it. So that might be something that is not quite familiar to, to um, let's say, Western jurisdictions. But in China, it is really, really important to have um, all the measures for trade secrets 
protection documented and notarized. But of course, there are countless measures um, and countless security technologies that can be implemented, um, fingerprint scanners, um, video cameras, etc. So how, how to choose the ones that are really, really, uh, really efficient and valuable in, in, in your case? Um, we created uh, some kind of overview and some evaluating tool. And um, there are several factors, the function. Does it provide adequate protection against know-how know loss? How high is the damage prevention potential? Complexity, how complex is it to be installed, to be, uh, to be, to be um, like supervised and everything? Of course, how, how, how expensive is it? Is it cost effective or is it just too expensive? Do we have any legal restrictions? especially in case of data protection and everything. And um, if you put all those factors together and then evaluate them and also give them a weighting, as you see at the, at the, the second column to the right, then you get a score in the end. And then for every single measure that you might want to implement, you have a certain score. And from that, you can decide on what technologies you want to implement and what are the best that are useful for your spe uh, specific case. I remember one interesting example from the case in Changshu. We said it's strictly prohibited to bring in a mobile phones with a camera into the laboratory, the R&D laboratory. And the Chinese people rejected this. It's absolutely impossible to leave the, the mobile outside the room in China. Absolutely impossible. So what was the solution of this method, of this um, measure? We said, OK, that's just a small group of five people. And then these five people uh, get company mobile phones without a camera, with a card. The companies pay this so, so they can call their wife or <laughs> whatever. Uh, and so they, they had their phone inside the laboratory, but without a camera. That was a solution, very simple. So that was it for, for the content of our webinar. Um, we now have some, t some spare time left. Yes, we do. We have some minutes left to answer all the questions that you have asked. And um, yeah, let's start with the first question. Can you open the window, the question window here? Yeah, just a minute. It's very small here. Question, how to protect software in China? Oh, that's Marika. Um, that's a very good question, and yes, obviously it's related to uh, trade secrets. Um, it is theoretically possible to register software as a patent in under certain conditions that they still fulfill a tech or lead to a technical result. So as you can hear, this is quite complicated, and even due to the long registration. Um, time needed uh, for patents, it might not be the right solution for software. So this means often for software, there are only two ways of protection. One is trade secret and the other is copyright. Um, it's always possible to register a copyright for software in China. Um, it's also not complicated, uh, can be done really fast and inexpensive. But um, registration as a copyright is not a very good protection. As I said, it's uh, registered quite fast and the authority, the Copyright Bureau um, of the People's Republic of China won't really um, examine um, this case really deeply. They will just register it if you apply for it. So it's really easy. Um, to attack uh, copyright registration like that. So it might for um, a lot of companies be the best choice to protect software as a trade secret, with, which obviously means um, you have to um, implement the right protection measures and document them as we just uh, yeah, told you. So this is a um, 
complicated way or a difficult way to protect software, but it's, um, as far as we see it, in a lot of cases, the most um, efficient way of protecting software. Let me check the next question here. Can trade secret uh, protection replace patents, Alex? Um, I would say no. Um, even in the steadily, steadily um, accelerating technology and innovation cycles, it is still important to have your core IP protected by traditional IP such as patents and also, of course, uh, first and foremost, most trademarks. But still, I think that uh, both both ways of protecting IP, um, they complement each other. For every, so to say, piece of IP that you have, you need to consider whether you want to have it protected as a patent, which also goes along, of course, with having it published to some kind of extent, or to have it secretly safe within your hopefully very well protected vault inside your perfectly protected factory. So I would say um, still we need both kinds of traditional but also the, um, the new form of IP that is trade secret with, which might be more suitable to, to faster technology cycles. Uh, a legal question, how does a court in China prove whether the protective measures for trade secrets are adequate? Uh, so as I understand this, this question is asking how the court verifies if the um, evidence brought by the um, company is uh, really enough to prove to prove um, if the trade secret has been protected enough. Um, actually, this is uh, hard to say. Um, the judge will decide um, according to, to yeah, his, how, how he wants to decide it. But the thing is, the more you can, or the better you can prove that the protective measures have been implemented and um, the better the protective measures themselves are, um, the safer uh, litigation is for you. So um, this is mostly about documentation and implementation of protective measures. And um, yeah, it will be decided case by case actually. That shows again the very importance of have a good documentation and also especially in China, the notarization of every measure that you took. Um, yeah, as um, still, you might, you might think that you have a, a very good um, concept of uh, trade secrets protection if it's not documented to the court's standards or court's requirements or thoughts, then it might still be not worthless, but uh, worth less. <laughs> Let me check another legal question here. If we have a documents for protection of trade secrets, most cases control access control, will the court need evidence that the measures are actually implemented by relevant employees? I think that's the same answer. So no? yeah. you need always notarization. If you bring a, a document approved <clears throat> evidence to court, then the judge could say, oh, sorry, you have installed this measure. A measure after the incident, you give me proof uh, that you have installed this before the, the trade secret theft uh, did happen. No? Will a court in China always decide for a local company as getting know-how from Western competitors is, so to say, supported by Chinese China's government? Oh. Different question. Uh, so I can say something to about this. Um, so from our experience, um, courts in China are judging quite fairly. So that means normally we have not made the experience that local companies are supported by courts in China um, in case they are 
did something wrong or did illegal things. So something that can be done in this um, regard is try to um, sue companies in bigger Chinese cities, um, for example, Beijing, Shanghai. Um, there is normally no problem in getting fair decisions by the court. So this is our experience. Um, yeah. The, the Chinese system and also the Chinese government's um, opinion and stance towards intellectual property infringement is getting stricter and stricter and also in favor for Western companies. So China wants to get rid of the image of being a technology theft or a counterfeiter nation. And that's why in the recent years, more and more courts are rather biased towards Western companies in, in such cases than, um, than being um, biased towards the local companies. I have another question to the colleagues here. Um, with the new China cybersecurity law, the authorities, for example, police, have a direct access without announcement, direct access to the data of foreign companies in China, running a factory in China. I think this is very critical related to trade secrets. Um, so there are two things. Um, the first thing is, um, actually it's, it's not without a warning before. The only problem is um, that the cybersecurity law does not define how far in advance this um, notice has been given that uh, control is about to come. And the th second thing is, um, yes, um, the regulation allows um, the Public Security Bureau to um, access your, um, your internal network and assess your data. But actually, it's um, they are only allowed to um, access data that's uh, security related. Um, so this might be used to get access to sensible uh, know-how or data in the company. But so far, um, I do not know of any cases um, when that happened. But as it is China, well, it's something you have to keep in mind. And if there's a, a way to um, store really sensitive data um, on different servers than data related to uh, cybersecurity and uh, security in general, data security, then that might be a good solution to, um, yeah, at least um, have a lower risk of um, the Public Security Bureau uh, sneaking into your business data. Yeah. We should uh, never forget that China is increasingly under pressure of the United States technology war and the trade war, so they may be more interested uh, in European and perhaps Australian technology. So though they they look more to the West, to Europe uh, for for in new information they need for Made in China 2025 or so. Okay. Well, as far as I can see, there are no more questions. Um, well, thank you all for your attention.